Typically, I like to try to provide some perspective to not be super emotional, uh, to have some reason about what happens with TCU Athletics. I don't have a lot of that today for you. Uh, we're just going to let it rip. It's Locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day. You are Locked on Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. That's right, Locked On Horn Frogs, your team every day. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, Frogs fall to West Virginia 24 to 21 on Saturday. They are now three and two on the season, one and one and Big 12 play, and both of their losses have been at home. Uh, West Virginia is a good football team. I'll just say that right off the bat. They won that game. They played well. They are tough. They are physical. They have their limitations, uh, but they came in to Eamon G. Carter, and they got a victory. You know, uh, I-, I talked a little bit through the week about the quarterback situation, and last I had heard when I went on the air, it still didn't look great for Garrett Green, their starter, playing in that football game. And Garrett Green made a difference. I mean, he's not like, as I said, not the most amazing passer in the world. His numbers, 10 to 21, 142 yards, but was good on the ground, 12 carries for 80 yards, and, you know, like brought some juice to that team, brought some juice to that offense, added some extra dimensions that I think Nico Markiel couldn't do the week before against Texas Tech. But by and large, I thought TCU's defense played well. It wasn't perfect, held them to 24 points. You would have liked to have seen, you know, a few more stops. But overall, did a nice job. Um, They were fighting field position really the entire second half of that football game. Sonny Dykes talked about it in the post-game press conference. TCU could not move the ball all in the third quarter. And so West Virginia kept getting short fields. And Frogs had a big stop on fourth and goal. Thought the defense did okay. We're going to start with the offense. The TCU offense... And the second half of this football game was atrocious. They scored zero points. In the third quarter, they had one yard, one total yard. They could not do anything. Uh, Brandon Coleman was out, and that had a big impact on the offensive line. We've discussed this year that the interior offensive line, they've lost, you know, they lost three big pieces from last year's team. It's been a struggle in short yard situations. But all that being said, They've been able to run the football. I mean, every game this year, they've been able to run the football. They could not run the ball against a stout uh, West Virginia defensive front. Amani Bailey had 19 carries for 55 yards. He averaged basically three yards a carry. Chandler Morris, 11 carries for 51 yards. But 19 for 55 for Amani is kind of misleading. I mean, he had some nice runs on the last couple drives in the fourth quarter of that football game. But before that, it was just a lot of, Two yards here, no gain there, loss of one, gain of three. Like there was no room to run the football. And they also really struggled in pass protection. And it affected Chandler Morris. I mean, you could tell he was uncomfortable. He was constantly having to move out of the pocket, roll around. And they got sacks in big moments. I mean, Frogs were driving down 24-21, their second to last drive of the game. Not sure what happened. It looked like maybe an RPO play, run pass option. But Chandler pulled the ball from Amani Bailey off a uh, you know, little play-action fake, and he was immediately sacked in the backfield. They had two sacks on the first drive of the third quarter to blow up that drive. It just felt like the entire second half of that football game, they had free runners. And the red zone offense, really in this game, just finishing drives and having success on the plus side of the field was non-existent again. Now, got off to a really good start. You know, Chandler hit J.P. Richardson on a slant pattern, and he took it to the house. 59 yards. First drive of the game, you're at 7-0 early. West Virginia came back, and they answered. They scored uh, quickly on their own. And TCU put together a a couple more nice drives. You know, had another explosive play where Chandler pulled the ball uh, on, like, a zone read type play. Took it around um, the outside for, I think, 35-yard touchdown run or 33-yard touchdown run, something like that. And that gave them a 14-7 to lead. West Virginia tied it up again. And on a fourth and two play, um, TCU took a shot and scored another touchdown. And Frogs hooked up with Dalen Wright, um, 36-yard touchdown pass on fourth and two, and had a 21-14 lead going into halftime. 
had the ball come out in the second half. I felt good about it. I was like, okay, you scored a touchdown there at the end of the half. You get the ball first in the second half, go score. They couldn't do it, and they could not move the ball at all in the second half of that football game. And it played into some issues on special teams. Um, Griffin Kell missed a 53-yarder in the first half. Uh, they went for it on a fourth and one in a situation where if they kicked it and they made it, they could have gone up 10. They get stuffed and get no points on that drive. And then Griffin had two kicks blocked at the end of the ball game on consecutive drives. And I don't know. I mean, it wasn't like West Virginia got through the line and blocked it. They were low kicks that they just reached up and, and got. Not sure what's going on with Griffin at the moment, but he's struggling and doesn't seem to be in the best headspace. But it doesn't help. I feel like he's constantly coming on the field this year attempting a 46-yarder or a 53-yarder or a 55-yarder because this offense keeps getting negative plays. They'll get down in plus territory, and they'll have you know have a sack or a holding penalty or a jet sweep that goes for a three- or four-yard loss, and then they're behind the chains. And then it becomes a much more difficult field goal attempt. Now, one of those situations yesterday uh, was an intentional grounding call that cost them seven yards. That I guess by the letter of law, it was intentional grounding, but it was miscommunication between Chandler Morris and Dalen Wright, and um, Chandler couldn't get the ball. Like, he just threw it away, or he threw it where he thought Dalen was going to be. Dalen was nowhere near it. Nobody was nowhere near it. And so they threw the flag. Usually, intentional grounding is called because the quarterback's desperately attempting to escape a sack, and they throw the ball away. This was not the, you know, the situation in this case. Um, and then even in the last drive of the game, they were moving a little bit. Things stall out. Third and seven. Chandler gets twisted up like a pretzel. And somehow, like I'll give him credit, somehow has the presence of mind to fling the ball out of his hand as he's getting tackled. And they end up, they call it a sack on the field. They end up calling an incompletion after review. And it saved them like seven yards. But it was still a 53-yard attempt that Griffin Kell had to make. And it gets blocked again or 55-yard attempt, I believe, excuse me, that he had to try, and it gets blocked. And so even in that situation, you know, it worked out, but, like, couldn't get first downs and then kept moving backwards. Like, you can't do that. You can't continue to make mistakes like this. But the the things that stood out to me the most, like, there, there are aspects of this offense that are still issues. Still don't really feel like they have a go-to wide receiver. J.P. Richardson led the receiving efforts with three catches for 87 yards. Dalen Wright had three catches for 60 yards. Both guys had a touchdown. I really like Dalen Wright. I think Dalen Wright might end up being this guy. Savion Williams also had a good night catching the football. So I, I feel like actually that might be moving in the right direction. But by and large, these receivers are still struggling to get separation. Last night you couldn't run the football, which was a new problem. And this O-line is banged up right now, and it's already a group that – wasn't playing like I would say they were playing okay. They were playing at a passable level. Now with these injuries, specifically to Coleman, they, I mean, they failed last night. They just couldn't get it done. Couldn't run the ball, couldn't protect Chandler Morris, and it affected every aspect of this offense. And I said this before the season. I was like, listen, if you can't block, like that's one of those things that you can't scheme up for. You can try to a certain extent. You can use the quick game, which TCU did that last night. You can use a quick game. Uh, you can try to, you know, just basically throw the ball a lot and get the ball out of your quarterback's hand as fast as possible, get the ball to your playmakers in space. But there's a limited shelf life there. There's still no vertical passing game. Chandler missed on some throws. That could have been big plays. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's again, and they're still struggling. Like the offense is still struggling in short yardage. There's still drives that are just stalling out, you know, in, in plus territory. But this is a second loss now. You know, Colorado game, a game they could have and should have won. And, yeah, Colorado, they've come back to earth a lot, but they seem like a pretty solid team. And there was a huge challenge that TCU had to play them in week one with basically no familiarity in what they were doing. Um, But this game, West Virginia, I mean, West Virginia, I'll, I'll give them credit. They're a good football team. And they have, a, they have an identity. They have a clear system that they're executing well. But this was a game that you could have won by two touchdowns if you just take care of your business. 
come out of the locker room in the third quarter and go score. And Sonny talked about this after the game. This is now two games this year where they, the offense has had the ball. It's not an ideal situation. You want to win every game going away, but the reality is you, you don't. Offense had the ball with a, a three-point deficit, but they have a chance to go down and score plenty of time on the clock, go down and kick a field goal to tie it, or go down and score a touchdown to win it. And in both instances, against Colorado and West Virginia, they have not been able to get it done. Last year's team was so good in these pressure situations, and it just hasn't panned out for this year's team to this point. Special teams was an issue. I mean, again, I think the defense played pretty solidly, but you would have loved to have tried to keep West Virginia under 20 points. Didn't happen. But this was on the offense. This game was on the offense. You can't get shut out in the second half of a football game, even against a good West Virginia defense. They were moving the ball great in the first half. I mean, they had some drives stall out, but they were moving the football. And Matt brought up a point last week. He was like, listen, maybe a lot of this creative play calling that Kendall Brow seems to be going to in these third and fourth and short situations is just a byproduct of him not trusting this offensive line. And I mean, I agree with that fully at this point. I, I think that's, that's the, that's the rub here. Fourth and one, you know, in the first half, they go for it. Don't get it. And they had another fourth and one later in the game. And I'll talk about that. I'll talk about that after a break. I need to take a break here. I'll talk about that situation. Also just talk about this team and kind of where they're at. We'll do all that next. It's Locked On Home Frogs, your team every day. All right, if you need to hire somebody, you can use LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every potential hire can feel like a high-risk wager. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and free. You can add uh, your job posting to their hiring frame to make sure you get more eyeballs on that job posting. Uh, they have simple tools like screening questions to make it easy to focus on candidates with the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Again, that's linkedin.com slash college. You can post your job for free. LinkedIn Jobs, they're a uh, LinkedIn, excuse me, they're a proud sponsor of the Lockdown Network. All right, Locked On Horn Frogs, uh, segment two. So breaking down a, a specific situation of yesterday's game, that was really confusing to me. So Frogs are down 24-21, but they got the ball, and they're moving for the, really the first time in the second half. This is about midway through the fourth quarter. They're moving the ball really for the first time um, in that part of the football game. And once again, they start to kind of self-sabotage once they get into West Virginia territory. Um, had a first and 10 of the West Virginia 37. Chandler gets sacked, now it's second and 15. Chandler gets a couple yards to make it third and nine, but then there's a false start on Dalen Wright, and so now it's third and 14. And Chandler completes a pass to Dalen Wright, and in live action on the field, it looked like Dalen was across the sticks when he caught the ball, and then he got driven out of bounds. But they spotted him a yard short. And so TCU kind of rushes the line. And I'm not sure. There was confusion here. And I think part of the confusion might be that I thought when he caught it, he had a first down. And maybe the coaching staff thought that too. But all of a sudden, it's like, no, it's fourth down. It's fourth down and one. But I would – and one thing that frustrated me about the broadcast, maybe I missed it. I did not see a replay. If anybody saw a replay of this, let me know. But they didn't show a replay. And so it's fourth and one, and Sonny calls a timeout. Or no, he didn't call a timeout. Excuse me. Sonny didn't challenge it. He didn't call a timeout. They get up to the line. looks like they're going to run a play on fourth and one. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, it's fourth down. we got to go for it. And again, I think this is simply, well, one, it's the fourth quarter of the game. you, you got to be more careful about the risk you're taking because you're running out of opportunities. But secondly, you have an offensive line that's struggling to get the job done. They're struggling to uh, make plays and convert on third and fourth and short. And so I don't think they believed in this football team to get that fourth and one. And so they just run Griffin Kell out there. And it was, I mean, it wasn't as 
crazy as bazooka play, but like the play clock is running down and Jordy Sandy's trying to get everybody set and get Griffin going. And they did this against nickel state before their halftime. And Griffin actually nailed that kick. And I don't know what happened. I mean, he's just not getting good trajectory on the, on this ball, but he just kicks a line drive and West Virginia. I mean, they didn't have a, like, they're not rushing super intensely. They're just kind of engaging with, the uh, kick protect team and one of their big guys in the middle just lifts his hand up and he gets a block. And it was such an anticlimactic end to a drive that was moving pretty well. But I just had so many questions in that sequence. First off, why are you not calling timeout? Secondly, like, can you challenge that? I mean, can you challenge the spot there? Are you, know, are you communicating with the officials? Like, what's happening? And it might have been as simple as they thought they had a first down, and then they find out, I don't know, it's fourth and one, and you're halfway through with the play clock. But at that point, I know timeouts are precious, but burn a timeout. Like, use a timeout and try to reset. Now the defense gets a stop. West Virginia had a third and one, and I don't know why Neil Brown and his coaching staff decided to throw the football on third and one. I guess, you know, they thought they'd kind of catch TCU napping in the situation. But they try to throw the ball in third and one, and Bud Clark breaks up a pass to the tight end. And so TCU got the ball back and got one more chance to go down the score, and they couldn't do that. But the attention to deep, like last year, I praised this coaching staff so much, and Sonny in particular, for just how good they were at understanding, you know, different situations, um, knowing how to manage this football team. Sonny being a great CEO, so just taking talented people and not like overcomplicating things, just being like, okay, I got good people that are talented. I'm going to let them do their thing. I'm going to sort of just manage this thing and stay out of the way. And this year, the vibe just seems off. And I mean, I know like they're missing so much. They're missing so much from last year's team. Hot take, I think Steve Avila might be the guy they missed the most this season. Like he's a really they could use him on this offensive line right now. Uh, Max Duggan obviously is in the NFL. Quentin Johnson in the NFL. I saw Darius Davis, uh, the Chargers put him in the backfield today, and he took a carry and he broke off a really long run. Um, they miss Tay Barber. They miss Wes Harris and Alan Ali. Like there's a lot of players off this team that they miss. But there's also a lot of talent on this football team. And they've now dropped two games where they were double-digit favorites at home. And that's just, I mean, you can't do that. Like, the Colorado game kind of makes sense. And if if they completely turn things around, which they can still do, then we could have looked back at the Colorado loss and be like, okay, yeah, got caught off guard against a team that was, you know, a big mystery to everybody and found yourself in the middle of a dogfight and weren't quite ready for it. But West Virginia, it was just like the whole night, everything seemed disjointed and so lackadaisical. And that's been my biggest complaint with this, this offense. It just seems so, like it works at times. And they, they hit on some big plays. But even when, on the drives that work, it just it just seems so out of sync. And they're still not doing a great job on first down. And I know part of that is when you have battle line play, it can make things hairy everywhere. But, I mean, it's got to get better. It's got to get cleaned up. Um, and I don't like, I don't know what happened in that situation. And there's been a lot of those kind of head scratching situations this year that has sort of just been a microcosm of this season, but rough night for the frogs. Uh, when we come back, we'll break down kind of where we go from here. And I'll, I'll talk about just, you know, the mentality of this football team. We'll do that next year on Lockdown Horn Frogs. All right, FanDuel, there are a lot of great NFL games on today. Cowboys rolled over the Patriots. And if you love the NFL, you need to download the FanDuel app or go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make sure you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on because if you're a new customer, you can get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed if you just place a $5 bet down. $5 gets you $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get on the action. You can bet on spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. 
FanDuel official partner of the NFL. So TCU's three and two. They go on the road and play Iowa State this week. On paper, that seems like a game you should win. But I mean, I just talked about some of their struggles this year. Um they go play BYU at home after that. And then they kind of hit that gauntlet of Texas Tech, Kansas State, or Kansas State, Texas Tech, Texas, Baylor, Oklahoma. They could still turn this thing around. The way they're playing right now, they look like a six or seven win team, which I think would be a disappointment to everybody. I thought last night was a chance for them to make a statement, and they sort of took two steps back. Um, now, I will say this. I think there's talent on this roster. I think they can find a way to cobble together a working identity on both sides of the ball. I don't think Sonny Dykes and this coaching staff have forgotten how to coach. I think Sonny Dykes is a really good football coach. I had people tweeting at me last night talking about, well, he just did this with Gary's guys. Okay. That was a very talented roster. I think that's been proven both with what they did last season and with the fact that there's so many guys that are playing in the NFL right now, but let's be serious about this. I love those. I love that core group. They were amazing. In the three years before Sonny got there, those players I was doing the quick math in, in my head. They went 16 and 18 over those three seasons. Two five and seven seasons and a six and four season in 2020. But in two of those three years, they missed a bowl game. The only bowl game they had qualified for before Sunday got there and those three seasons was that Texas Bowl against Arkansas that got canceled because of COVID outbreak. The coaching staff deserves a ton of credit or maximizing the talent on that football team. You guys watched 2021. You know what that looked like. Sonny Dykes is a good football coach. He's hired good people around him. They have not forgotten how to coach football. Now, I don't have a great answer for what's going on right now. I kind of broke down some of the X's and O's and the nuts and bolts of it in the first two segments, which is, you know, they got offensive line issues. I think, there is talent on this roster, but we may have overshot and overvalued how collectively talented they were. Another thing I don't quite understand. I don't know where the leadership is on this team. And that's one thing that Sonny talked about a lot in the offseason. He was like, that was a very player-led group. You didn't really have to get on them too much about, you know, staying focused, staying present, staying in the moment. They held each other accountable. They were hungry. They got after it. And last night I was watching that game. And it's tough to judge effort and intensity. And I'm not accusing anybody of not trying. I understand that those players and coaches are working their tails off every day. They're working a lot harder than me, the podcaster, right? I know they take these losses a lot harder than I do because they're putting in work every day. And this is what they do. They want to win. They want to be good at this. They want to be successful. I understand that. I don't really get... Let me say this. Before the year, there was so much talk about, you know, nationally. Like, well, what happened last season was a fluke. They lost all these players. TCU was a flash in the pan. They're not going to be anywhere near the playoff, anywhere near the you know, national championship race. Which, unfortunately, with these two losses, they've kind of already made that true. But I thought this team would come out with a huge chip on their shoulder because of everything that had been said about them. And just the discourse around this team. And I haven't really seen that. I haven't seen a team that is just looking to prove everyone wrong. And I know they're young at different spots. And ultimately, they have lost two games by a combined six points. We could be talking about a team that's 5-0, and but we're not. And you are what your record says you are. And right now, they're a 3-2 and football team. And they're going to have to figure this out. Because this was, this was the more manageable part of the schedule. <laughs> you know, I... 
I said before the season, I was like, I think they can go seven and zero in these first seven games. At best, they will go five and two. And I don't know how great I feel about it right now because BYU is a pretty good football team, and you have to go on the road to play Iowa State, even though they have, you know, their one true road game against Houston, they played super well. But the atmosphere in Ames is going to be a lot more difficult and hostile than the atmosphere uh, at Houston Stadium. All apologies to Parker Ainsworth from Locked On Cougs, but I'm just being honest. Somebody's going to have to dig deep and, and turn the tide. It can be done, but this is now two games where you spit the bit. And there's not a lot of people outside of this sphere that's going to be talking about TCU football over the next few weeks. They're just going to have to take care of their business and get it done and get back in the conversation and become a much better football team before they hit that stretch run of going to Manhattan to play Kansas State and hosting Texas, going on the road to Norman to play Oklahoma, going on the road on a Thursday night to play Texas Tech in Lubbock. Getting Brandon Coleman back would be huge. This offense getting more consistent would be great. But inconsistent has been the word I would describe this team so far. You see the talent. You see times where you're like, okay, I get why everybody is so high on this roster. But then there's a penalty or a mistake that leads to a lost yardage. I want to hear from you. Hit me up in the YouTube comments. You can hit me up on Twitter, at Simcox Steven. We're here every day, right? Like, whatever the result is, I'll be here giving you guys a platform to go back and forth with me. And I appreciate you listening or watching whenever it is and however it is you do. It's Locked on Horn Frogs. It's your team every day. <laughs>